Diplomacy Live Podcast Live Welcome to the 007 episode of the Diplomacy Live Podcast. This conversation with Dr. Gordan Akrab was recorded in his office in Zagreb uh, exactly a year ago. Uh, two years before uh, recording took place, a big earthquake hit Zagreb. You will see remnants of it uh, on the wall behind us. Also on the wall is a photo of perhaps one of my favorite albums and one of my favorite bands of all time, Pink Floyd. Uh, the album is Dark Side of the Moon. And I wouldn't want to project too much into that album and the significance that Pink Floyd wished with that. But the aspect of the prism, I think, is an interesting one to think about when we're talking about the combination of diplomacy and intelligence as aspects of statecraft. Because they both deal with how information becomes intelligence, how uh, a ray of light becomes that prism of uh, the many colors that, that we see, how it becomes a usable information that uh, states can use in their day-to-day -day activities. But all of that comes down to whether it is relevant or not, whether it is usable or not. And that is the broader question that needs to be answered by any state when it thinks about how it structures its state institutions, especially uh, its diplomatic and security intelligence aspects of it. Dear viewers and listeners of the Diplomacy Light podcast, welcome uh, for another episode of the 007 uh, podcast, uh, and appropriately so. This podcast, uh, the topic of it is this combination of diplomacy and intelligence gathering. Uh, a combination that I think that even many in diplomacy don't pay enough attention to understanding. And this is why we really have someone uh, who has quite a bit of understanding and uh, practical knowledge uh, uh, over this issue, both in the intelligence world and in the, the diplomatic world. So Gordon, thank you very much for accepting to be on the, the Diplomacy Light podcast. And I really look forward to our conversation on this. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's my pleasure to be here because it's extremely important, uh, not just because what is going on, it's be because the things that the diplomacy and intelligence are overlapping their activities during the first history of the mankind. And they developed it uh, much on a much wider and broader sense that we usually think. In fact, if if one looks at even the the, the history of diplomacy, its main developments uh, uh, in the beginning, perhaps just communication between kings, and then a slow institutionalization of, of diplomacy. Uh, one of the milestones is when the resident embassy started being uh, created, and, um, especially in 15th century, late 15th century Italy, but also uh, here in the region and many uh, other places where the well, the first function really of of those uh, were to gather information, to understand where they are, and to do that on an ongoing basis, which is actually the work of uh, what we now understand as intelligence, isn't it? Yes, uh, as you mentioned that correctly, first from, from the history of the human conflicts and wars, we know that, especially in the time that came before those things, those activities, those processes, the kings and dukes and leaders try to send their personal invoice or messages to the other sides or to create alliances or to try to make a mess or try to do something according to their own wish. But the, one of the main functions of those messengers, later ambassadors, yeah. was to, uh, let's, get, we, let's get collect some information. We would like to know what is really going on there because we would like to collect the information as much as we can, reliable information, in order to bring decisions that are going to go according to our wishes and that will help to, for, uh, to fulfill our expectations. Yeah. Was it in the time of war? Was it time before the war or after the war? So there is a sense of common ground between diplomacy and intelligence. Diplomacy from the first point of view, uh, the way when they developed their skills uh, was, as you mentioned, not just collect information to represent the leader of the country. But in, in a core, it was intelligence. Later, it was developed as the international relations became much more complex. Yeah. Intelligence was be, become a, a one, of the, one of the 
sub activities of the diplomas, diplomatic activities of every country. And if in those times it was uh, perhaps the ambassadors or whoever was the chief uh, of of that uh, in the nuncio, the um, it, it perhaps they thought that well I'm well suited to gather uh, information and, and do this. But at one point it was seen that perhaps this is something better left to other uh, diplomats, so that the ambassador, as you rightly said, really represents the sovereign, be it the king or right now the the democratic sovereign people. And it's not as suitable, it was seen, uh, to be able to uh, gather information. And at the same time, if it was uh, regular information, perhaps a diplomat is better suited. But then once you start collecting information that is hidden by a side, then it is more suitable to have someone who is not the representative of the sovereign uh, do that, isn't it? Well, by developing the state and societies during the time, the states uh, saw the, the necessity to make differences. Yeah. Because uh, it was the ambassador. In most cases, has a much wider spectrum of activities. And it's a very unpleasant way if someone, especially ambassador, is going to court in collecting the or gathering the information or intelligence that is not so appropriate and that the whole, uh, whole country doesn't like to be collected by the, someone of the foreigners. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the reasons, of course, yeah. why they get her in, uh, they develop the special intellig intelligence service because also the, the states and societies at that time needed to uh, organize some kind of intelligence gathering process inside the countries in order to know what is really going, what is really going on, and to bring up the decisions that is going in favor of the leaders, and in that way, they develop the activities and abilities in order to collect information from abroad, yeah. and complexity of information that were needed to be gathered and collected, collected and analyzed, it brought up the decisions. Yes, we need special persons who are going to be collecting only information and data that will be transferred to intelligence. And it's an interesting uh, point in this combination of diplomacy and knowledge, and in terms of how uh, there is this, as the well-known from the inter in information communication technology world of data, and then that becomes information, uh, data in a context that becomes knowledge uh, the moment it is used in a, in a certain way. Uh, but one can put intelligence in the middle, right? And you've, you've, in your writing, you've pointed to that uh, aspect where it's actually intelligence uh, to a great degree that can make knowledge more knowledgeable, more uh, context uh, abundant, let's put it. Intelligence, uh, in the way how we understand it now, has a three different meanings. First, intelligence is a word that describes the organization that is responsible for collecting different kinds of data and information, transforming them in intelligence, mm. and then to, to create this as a wisdom that is ready for a decision-making process in order to uh, prepare, to present a solid base for a decision-making process. Second thing is the intelligence process as a process of collecting, analyzing, and dissemination of the, all the data and information that are collected and transferred to intelligence. Yeah to those persons to whom those intelligence and counterintelligence agencies are subordinated to. And third meaning is intelligence is this final document, final written document, that intelligence or counterintelligence agencies are sending to their superiors. Is it going to be the president or the prime minister to the king or someone else? Yeah. It depends about the structure of the state. So that is the thing when we are talking about intelligence in a general term. Uh, in the knowledge hierarchy, uh, Intelligence agencies are gathering the data and information, and they are transforming them in a different steps using the hu uh, human abilities, using the machine abilities, machine learning, artificial intelligence. But at the end, there's the human experts that I give the final touch, final value of the information collection process and interpretation mm -hmm. and transferring to intelligence as a useful knowledge for making decisions. And when you make the decision, then you decide what you do, and then you are following those results of those activities, consequences of those decisions, and you are monitoring the effectiveness of your intelligence. And in that way, we are trying to close the circle yeah. in order to have a much better control of our activities, of our efficiency, of our intelligence. 
And that's, that's one of the ways what needs to be done, especially today in modern intelligence and in modern public information systems, because this is the way how we can learn to fight in best way against the disinformation that becomes a main weapon of the uh, influence operations and influence processes in modern times, and it will be future. And it seems like we are, again, in a major crossroads historically. Uh, perhaps one where in, in the 19th century, where there was uh, the most significant bureaucratization, the first time that even in the intelligence community, uh, a bureaucracy, as you said earlier, it w of expertise was, was created. And then in the 20th century, developed in different ways, uh, in different countries. Uh, it, one interesting thing is that I, I think that a lot of uh, theoretical knowledge is uh, gathered about the major powers, you know, and the superpowers during the, the, the Cold War. But it's actually even middle and, and smaller powers who can have very effective, not just intelligence, but this good combination between their diplomacies and intelligence to the best of their state's interest. Uh, don't you, uh, I mean, you've, you've been in the, right in the middle of, 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 of that nexus, and it, would you share any insights on this? Uh, let me give you a few things from the first point of view for the bureaucratization. I remember when we were conducting the process of transformation of a free and democratic and modern Croatian intelligence community, and we have been uh, uh, we have been we, we were in contact with uh, quite a lot of partners and friends. And one of those uh, experts from abroad said, "There is only one thing you have to avoid: forget." And, uh, and try to avoid the malicious influence of the bean counters. We said, what do you mean by that bean counters? What does it mean? Because we didn't know. They said bureaucratization. Do not bureaucratize them yourself. For example, bureaucratization of intelligence is a very tough thing that needs to be have in mind because intelligence agencies and counterintelligence, of course, does not work as a usual agencies. Yeah. For example, if you remember the, the Skipper case, and the poisoning case of the Novichok by the by the Russian scene the, in the UK several yeah. years ago. And one of the key evidence that Russia, Russian intelligence agencies are behind it, was collected by the by the Dutch intelligence and by some other intelligence using the mistakes and miscalculations of the Russian bean counters, Russian administration. Because the the group that there was a group of the Russian diplomats that was sent to to the to the Netherlands to the Hague, because in the Hague there is a, this organization for the OPCW, yeah, OPCW, where there was one of the uh, one of the samples from the Novichokins from the Salisbury was sent to be analyzed. The Dutch in country intelligence was attracted by some of their behavior. Let's see what the people are doing. Yeah. But because of the few mistakes that they, their case officers did due to the necessity to have very efficient way by the local bureaucracy in Moscow, they keep the bills, they directly connected them with the Russian intelligence agency. Yeah. And, so, and that's the problem with bureaucratization. Secondly, what you said, it's uh, extremely important because uh, not so many people know that the uh, intelligence agencies has a, can have, and probably in most cases have in time of conflicts in wars, very significant influence in preparations, not just in military preparations, but keeping in touch and trying to solve those combat, uh, uh, combat challenges in a peaceful way. For example, we, when we try to have quite close, we, we sent several times messages that we would like to share our opinions in order to stop the aggression to Croatia in the 90s, that we would like to have a direct contact in order to prevent atrocities, <coughs> to prevent casualties, to prevent crimes, but there was no response. For quite a long time there was no response, okay, we did not ask to, we did not try to ask every time, we sent once one or two messages, there was no question, there was no answer. But in 95, when we successfully managed to conduct several operations in 94 and 95, and after the operation storm, we received a message via messenger, via middleman, via middle agency, 
Yes, Serbs are a little bit interested to have a contact with you because they know what is going on, then they realize. And that was a process that, of course, intelligence does not do these kind of things on their own. You have to ask state leaders to approve or disapprove of those activities, and we, we were approved to, do, to have those activities, to have these connections, because the President Tujman main idea was to try to solve all of the disputes, even in the military field, with conversations. Mm -hmm. Because that means that less combat activities, less military activities, increased number of intelligence activities, decreased the number of victims on both sides. Dead and wounded persons and miss, in, in missing people. And, for example, they're in, in the process of negotiations, or for example, in the, for during the Dayton Agreement and before it and after it, the role of our intelligence have was, it's not because I was part of that, but we have a very, very important role in bringing the Serbian side to the table and bringing the decision that we were positioned not to conduct military operations in order to liberate the occupied Danube region. We did it through the peaceful reintegration process that saved thousands of lives on both sides. Yeah. And this is one of the things that we did. And we are very proud of that. Yeah. Because there is an overt diplomacy, there is something that we see, but there is intensive activities of the shadow diplomacy yeah. or cover diplomacy, because in many times, intelligence officers, despite the fact how high are they on their ranks, can easily go unnoticed, can much, can do much more better, can have a much better results in, in process of, let's say, negotiations with other opposite side than usual diplomats. Yeah. Um, and perhaps the diplomacy became jealous in, in a way at one point is a, is a, is a, is an institution. Uh, I think that again, if one goes back to the to the nineteenth century, it was uh, kind of military intelligence that uh, bureaucratized itself first, really got the specialties. Um, other types of intelligence then developed in in commercial activities and in, um, in the naval activities. If it is, it, within the military, you could have different kind of aspects that that are covered. Uh, and to this day, uh, I think that the the United States has something like seventeen agencies that are focused on on different aspects of of intelligence uh, uh, gathering, including diplomacy, right? Including foreign affairs has uh, the ministries of foreign affairs of different countries have their own because they perhaps saw that well, foreign affairs are our own domain. We should not uh, fully give it uh, to this new institution that is arising, especially when it comes to political issues. Uh, right, but it, it's really one, uh, two aspects of a spectrum uh, in terms of the types of communication. All of them have a role in statecraft. I think that both can be, even though, uh, uh, as we spoke earlier, the distinction between tradecraft and statecraft is there. It's all statecraft. It's all in the interests of, of, of the states, uh, but with, with different ways. Perhaps just a few words on this aspect of the foreign affairs, if that is the political uh, part of it, both in terms of the sides in, in the gathering of information, but also in the side of perhaps what is more and more becoming evident through social media in the shaping of events uh, of where one is sent. And managing the events and creating them. <laughs> but that is the business of intelligence. If you cannot control, create it. Yeah. Uh, Foreign policy is one of the key aspects of every state that needs to be conducted in a way to fulfill their uh, expectations and to to build up a functional state because nobody can live alone anymore. Yeah. Uh, nobody can win wars anymore alone, as General Stan McChrystal said a few years ago in the F Foreign Affairs uh, Journal. We know that from our war, for independence from 90s, that we were not a we were not able to win this war alone without support and without the help not just from the Croats from abroad but from the wider elements from the and partners from the international community in order that foreign policy needs to be successful they need information as any part of the governing process and most of the information that they are looking for foreign affairs they are coming from the uh, spectrum of 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 the maze where it's not so easy to to come in and to enter and to, to collect them without possessing a simple, simple, some kind of risk. Mm. 
between partners and friends, there is not such a way. But usually, intelligence agencies are changing the data information intelligence between themselves on a bilateral and multilateral level. Because we, the fact is, as I said, nobody can win wars anymore at all. And then if we want to face the common, let's say, security challenges, I don't want to use the word enemies, uh, other series, we need to be together. For example, uh, most of the agencies that wanted to come to understand what is going on, for example, in former Yugoslavia, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Serbia, in Kosovo, in North Macedonia, came to Croatia to ask for opinion, because we we knew the context. Context, and information communication sciences is, is it's a very simple fact. If you know a context, if you have a deeper knowledge about the context, less information you need to understand what is really is going on, to read between the lines. Say, if you have a less context, there's more information that you need. And that's some that's the difference. Uh, on international level, exist several organizations that do really, they don't exist official. For example, everybody knows for the Five Eyes now. Uh, but not so many people knows for, uh, for example, band group. The, not so many people know for some other groups, Med Club and the others. There are other clubs where different kind of intelligence agencies and counterintelligence agencies from a different regions, different countries are gathered together in order to check to exchange valuable information. It's important to say, for example, that it while it looks like it's a paradox, but really that's the fact. Uh, as lower the level of relations between two or more intelligence agencies are, that's the highest level of information that they are sharing between themselves. So if you have a protocol or low level, uh, uh, no level of co uh, info, uh, co communication and cooperation process, you share just intelligence in mm. finished paper, not everybody. So final document. But as much as broader as wider, as deeper relations you have, and the deepest and the best cooperation between partners and allies, you are sharing the raw data. Mm. So basing data information that you are collected in order to help to the others that so that they have raw data, raw information that you collected from field using different methods and activities so that they can compare it with, with what they have and then to exchange it in these circles in order to get valuable and better intelligence. So, without that, uh, without this, let's say, uh, one of the arms that supports the foreign policy, it will be very hard to conduct any successful foreign policy. Because beside any successful politics are information. Mm. If you have a valuable information coming from trustworthy sources, and confidential sources, and they came on time, then you can bring a decision that will be in, will, that will be for a benefit for all of you. And that's it. That's especially important for the Allies. Try to remember a situation now when, before the war in Ukraine, before the Russian aggression, it was, it happens for the first time in history that one intelligence agency, we are talking about the United States intelligence agency, decided to share openly intelligence for the high high uh, high level of classification they declassified it in order to say this is the proof what we are doing this is the proof why we are doing what we are doing and this is the uh, evidence that we know what russians are intending to do and it's continued right now it's incredible to follow this this war for many different way reasons one of them is this this intelligence gathering uh i would mention for instance on one aspect, not just the U.S., but the U.K. has had, I think, weekly or in a few days, they're giving briefly, they've had daily, uh, sharing of information of, 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 as you say, highly classified information uh, that they have, and perhaps to a great degree, you know, the shape perceptions, uh, but also to, I mean, this is what, what, what it is. And another aspect that I find fascinating uh, to watch, it, it's... Uh, perhaps uh, troublesome to say fascinating when there's a war going on, but it is a new time when, when one has to really understand this. There's so much open source information that is being uh, shared uh, all around where people with either uh, intelligence backgrounds uh, or just an interest 
uh, are sharing information on the internet, what they find, and uh, uh, it, there's a, such an abundance of information at the moment that it's really it's really uh, a time where time has become so compressed. It is necessary to perhaps share as quickly as possible the raw data that one gets in order to really be to be able to act on it and to be able to have any meaning. Otherwise, it becomes irrelevant very quickly. Well, now we are talking about the different kinds of intelligence. Usually, there are several kinds of intelligence gathering process, humans by human, human operations by the soil agents, agents of place, agents of people, different kinds of agents. Seeing it as a signal intelligence, it means collecting the intel information by using the technical means. And also, let's be or just speaking on a general level, open source intelligence. Is it going to be via media, social media, social network, etc.? Never mind. But uh, what we are facing now, it's a huge amount of information and disinformation. <laughs> we we are in a situation that we can have that we have information cows or information toxication or infoxication of any activities that are important for at least two or three sites. Uh, there is so many valuable information that is publicly opened and available on the, on the social networks, but uh, classical media and uh, classical uh, public that is receiving those information does not does not went through a cross-checking process. That intelligence needs to do it because it's a very dangerous for intelligence that just took those informations obtained via open source intelligence as a fact. They need to make different cross-checkings. That is the reason why that's the process between uh, transferring data to have an actionable intelligence. That's on knowledge about, that's, a, that's the question why intelligence agencies are there for, in order to say, well, this is this information. And this, this, the author and creator of this, this information is this one, or this agency, or this government, or the state, in order to obtain those kind of results. So we have to avoid it. And we have to fight against it. We have to publicly disclaim them. And we are going to get another, another benefits for us if we do that. On the other side, let's use this as a primary intelligence. Second thing is the publication of so many information in the social networks and in open source intelligence is helping to both of the sides. And therefore, there is always a level of questions of how reliable uh, those informations are, how useful, or how malicious, how negative effects that can achieve, on, especially on the defenders. Therefore, if you remember, for example, the after the Paris massacre in Bataclan, in 2015, I think it was, and then in November there was a raid in these Islamic terrorist groups in, in uh, several cities in Belgium, uh, there was a lot of people on the streets that they tried to, to record and public those informations in the social networks. And it was the first time that Belgian police asked, and later it repeated after the Christmas uh, terrorist attack in, uh, in Berlin, in Berlin Christmas Market, and after in Vienna recently, uh, after the terrorist attack. Local police intelligence authorities asked for the people on the streets, please, you can record what is going on. You can take up the photos, you can take up movies, but videos, please, do not publicly open. Mm -hmm. do, not send a, do not send those information to the social networks because those who are on another side That's their aim. that can act according to your information, yep. send it to us. We have information communication center. We will protect your identity. We will keep your identity. But those informations are going to be helpful for us in order to fulfill our mission. And that means to identify, positively identify, and to f search and find and arrest terrorists. And it happened very significantly. And it repeated, as I said, to the next several years that uh, police started and audience and people accepted. They start to public photos of cats. Yeah. Cats in different positions, cats in military uniforms, cats uh, mm -hmm. in a war stars or Star Wars uh, activities, different. And that is the uh, thing that intelligence and security agencies ask and get support for people and make people that they feel, yes, we did something positive. 
and decrease the level of openness of information that is publicly open to all of the sites, decrease the influence of these informations, and increase their abilities in the, fulfilling their primary activities later after they, they those terrorist attacks uh, defined. So there are so many things that uh, it can be done with social networks. Social mm -hmm. networks are not just there for spreading these informations. If you can try to manage the process, then it can be uh, helpful to you. Yeah. If you are going to be able to come to position that you define the trends, then it's okay. Then you are in a winning side. But if you are forced to follow the uh, happenings, follow the incidents, follow the terrorist attacks, follow the uh, processes, then you are reprogrammed. There was a one commercial several years ago that, that said, first never follows. And that's the thing that needs to be, that is basic for activity for every intelligence agency. Mm. I know, for example, when we came to that, uh, during the, our homeland war for independence, we managed to develop our activities from 90s when we were defending ourselves and we were following the activities of the, of our enemy, let's say on this way. But we did during the time, we developed our abilities, especially in 92, 93. So in 94, we started to create trends. To create? Trends. Mm. We created topics, we created subjects, we created situations, and we created the activities that the our opponents needs to react on. Mm -hmm. So we change our position from position that you are following, we were in situation to create. And that's the position that you are on the way to be successful. Yeah. Let me ask you about um, one point of convergences and divergences between agencies, because uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, many countries have many different agencies with different uh, focus areas, um, uh, but they all, as we said, have a common threat, and that's national the national interests of, of the country. But there's a lot of overlap between them, isn't there? And in it and that overlap can be helpful because they can there can be a redundancy so that they make sure that nothing falls between the cracks and a major uh, issue happens. But there can also be some mission creep, as they call it, some uh, going into one other's uh, um, uh, area of expertise and then resistances and then fights between, especially when it comes probably fights for, for funds. I think that that's the eternal fight. Can you share your insights on, on this? Uh, when intelligence failed, mm. everybody knows for that. Yeah. Everybody heard about or terrorist attack or organized crime happening or, or some disaster. So that's the point. Yeah. But the, the most important point is that uh, the successful activities of intelligence and counterintelligence in most cases are not visible. Mm. And this is something that I remember it happened in, after the Bristol uh, hotel bomb explosion when IRA tried to kill the uh, uh, Prime Minister Thatcher. And she, she, she escaped and she survived and IRA said this famous sentence, okay, you did it this time but you have to be successful every time in okay. preventing our activities, and we need to be successful only one time. And that's the curse of intelligence and counterintelligence yep. activities. And one of the things that they are happening is those, as you said, the overlapping of activities. Sometimes uh, when you have a reasonable people, you can manage those kind of things. Because recently I read an, in a signature in an email for a one very esteemed colleague, he wrote a sentence in his signature that is one of the motto of intelligence. It should be treated like that. It's incredible how excellent things and amazing things can be done if no one cares who gets the credit. Mm. That's really good. For example, second thing is that uh, the, <laughs> it's usual to overlap the activities because it's very very hard today to say, okay, this is a foreign intelligence, this is internal intelligence, this is intelligence and counterintelligence. But it's it to be done with a much more complex approach. 
First, the intelligence officers are different by their habitus. Mm. They, they need to have a different uh, concept of mind. They need to be extrovert. They need to be open. They need to know how to connect with people, how to communicate, how to speak, how to listen, how to memorize. Because in most cases, intelligence officers are abroad. They're not in their own country. They know how they need to know how to act, how to behave, how to respect the laws of the of the country where they are living, and how to went unnoticed by the country intelligence in fulfilling their jobs. On the other side, counter intelligence officers need to be introvert. They need to take everything. Everything is suspicious. Everyone is suspicious. So everything is a potential problem. So it's a despite the fact that sometimes they're using same methods, same tools in they need to have a different approach from the beginning. And it's very hard to connect and to implement and integrate intelligence and counterintelligence abilities in one agency. Mm. It cannot go, it cannot give you positive results for a long time. We saw it in a different examples. Also, what is important to say that uh, in order to avoid overlapping, you need to have a, some kind of coordination control, communication, and management of all the intelligence community. For example, we faced this problem in the 90s when we were transforming our intelligence community that was existing during the communist Yugoslavia time to a modern democratic Croatian intelligence community. And we established a system that was much better than it was before and it was excellent. Still, it shows lots of benefits uh, uh, according to the latest results. Uh, we, okay, we limited the numbers of intelligence agencies. We have a one counterintelligence agency that was a part of Ministry of Interior. We have a military intelligence that was part of the uh, armed forces. Military counterintelligence that was part of the military uh, Ministry of Defense. We have a, a, a Croatian intelligence service that I was part of as uh, in the independent agency, part of the National Security Office, the directly uh, subordinate to the President of the, of the Republic. And we have a, but it did not have any substantial meaning, a, a part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but it was not an intelligence agency. It was more for uh, physical and technical security. So at that time, during the war, despite of the fact what was written so many times, we have a free and half intelligence agencies because military intelligence by the law was allowed to get uh, uh, to collect information information and create intelligence only during the wartime mm -hmm. and in peacetime they need to cooperate with, with the other parts of intelligence and then we have a coordination of intelligence community in order to control what is really is going on and to communicate and coordinate their activities and we have a external members of the intelligence community it was a crime police, it was a financial police, and tax, the Department of Taxes, and customs. Because in peaceful times, you need to have a cooperation, we're working with that. And that was a part of the national security concept, what we are talking about. And uh, not to forget, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is and needs to be done and be part of the national security concept, because not so many people realize that uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs has ability to uh, to appoint the to proclaim sanctions against someone in the international community, and this is some kind of repression also. You know, but uh, we are talking about the homeland security concept that is, for example, now in Croatia, it's national security concept that is supported by different areas of social life. For example, the five fighters are part of the homeland security concept. Academia, knowledge is very important and it's a part, especially for research and development, it's a part of the homeland security concept. Social activities, NGOs, the different group of citizens, part of the homeland security concept. And most important that it, it's extremely visible now in this war in Ukraine, private companies. Because especially in today's domain, when we are fighting with so many uh, security challenges that are coming from cyber domain and existing in cyber domain without cyber, uh, without private properties, private companies, private research and development abilities, we can't do effectively. During the Cold War, 
those research and development for the Supreme Technologies was part of the special operations within the intelligence and military. But now we are in private sector, money is private sector, knowledge is in private sector, and we need to cooperate very strongly in order to, to fight against the modern security challenges. Well, perhaps we will see representatives, and I think we are already, uh, of, of the private sector in, 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 in diplomacies. Uh, we've seen it so far in, in, in commercial activities, you know, promoting business, but all of a sudden this, as you rightly pointed out, uh, is becoming a factor as well. Um, perhaps as we conclude, uh, one aspect of, of, of this coordination and perhaps even tensions is what happens in, a, in, a, in an embassy, you know, where uh, the, the foreign affairs is the one that is the resident, it is it gives the diplomatic immunity, as you as you said, it can sanction, but it also has is the one that can have diplomatic immunity, which it can give to intelligence officers if it chooses. The military attaches sometimes uh, do that, uh, and you know it, I think it's important to uh, remind uh, uh, our our uh, viewers that intelligence gathering is, as we said earlier, one of the uh, aspects of of statecraft. It's also one of the key aspects of diplomacy, right? And in in its uh, in these embassies where we can see this communication flourish for the interests of the country, and sometimes not so much. I think I uh, know of, of examples of many countries where there is this ambiguity in terms of who's the boss. Sometimes is it the the ambassador or is it the person who is there sent in from the security services? And I think that if if, there, if it is better coordinated at home, these kind of ambiguities don't happen. Then the, 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 the functions are clear. Everybody knows what no one needs to do. Everybody's rooting for the same team. And nobody has captured power because in intelligence, you can get, gather a lot of power in, in one uh, uh, institution. And if I may kind of add one more thing to that is Perhaps that is one of the key strengths of democracies. I think that you know when you have democratic control uh, of intelligence services, it and f if democracy really properly uh, functions, you can avoid this kind of capture by private interest that can happen both at home and in one's uh, embassies. Do you think that it's it is it, 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 is it possible to really have good institutions that protect from this kind of capture at home and also from the type of animosities that can happen in different embassies between intelligence officers and diplomats. Well, in diplomatic and consular missions, mm -hmm. to, to avoid, and yes. not to forget them, uh, sometimes the people from the different backgrounds are connected and collected in, and gathered in order to f to act upon the the activities and uh, what has been told by the home country what they need to do. And just like uh, it's a small state, ambassador or consul general is the one who is uh, representing the, the president or the prime minister. It, it depends about the organization of the state. And therefore, then you have a military attaché, that you have economical attaché, cultural attaché, uh, consular section, and you have a sometimes intelligence. So you have a five, six, seven, eight, or maybe two or three different parts, different groups of people of different units of the, of the persons who are do, the, dealing with their job. Uh, problem is that we are talking about the military intelligence, military attaches uh, that is dealing with the military, sometimes military intelligence information, and intelligence uh, officers that are that are part of the diplomatic and consular missions. It, it's a little bit different situation. Yeah. First, uh, military members of the military office. Are all military uh, uh, military personnel, officers of sub officers. Some of them might be intelligence. Some of them does not need to be part of intelligence active uh, intelligence agencies. But sometimes, in especially in the larger in the diplomatic and consular missions, you have a, quite a lot of people who are dealing with intelligence. Those who are presented to the home country intelligence. Uh, uh, institutions, we call it the liaison officer. So there are people, persons who are connected there, they are publicly announced to the host country, who are they, what are they doing, and they are responsible to exchange the information, intelligence. 
And that's one of the reasons why the that's the role of the intelligence diplomacy. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes they call intelligence as a tradecraft. Because you're trading with the intel- information, intelligence that you are giving and receiving. And the people in the same craft. Of course. Uh, but on the other way, sometimes it might happen that you have intelligence officers and it's visible now, for example, when European Union member countries uh, expel so many, so, uh, so many Russian diplomats saying, yes, they are intelligence officers, but they are not just intelligence. They are, they are not members of the official liaison mm. department. They are doing their job covertly, illegally. So in English terminology, we are talking about the legal or illegal intelligence officers. But so we, we have the, the other kind of parts, the, the other definition here. So integrating their abilities in a well-functional unit, it's very hard. Uh, ambassador or consul general, I know for quite a lot of examples, not just Croatia, but, but the other countries, they, those two groups of people, they are directly subordinate, or subordinated to the respective ministries of institutions in their countries. Because not so many of the people within the diplomatic or consular mission does not have this high rank security clearance that is necessary to have this information to receive them. Second thing, uh, in most cases today, uh, due to the GDPR and due to the other regulations, it might be sound strange that the, the intelligence also needs to think about the GDPR <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> uh, you exchange information only up, uh, after you sign the agreement. How, when, in which way, with whom you are going to exchange those information. Because in intelligence cooperation, international cooperation, there is a rule of the third party rule. If I share some information, some intelligence with you, you are not allowed to share this intelligence with someone else without getting prior approval from myself. Otherwise, if you share it without my knowledge and without saying to the others to whom you share this information, you might create a, quite a lot of problems. Because I, sh- I gave them same info, you gave them same info, third party gave same info to another party and said, oops, we receive same information from three, four different sources that might not be together, that might not be coordinated. It means that this information is probably highly, uh, uh, highly relevant and reliable, and it might be true. Remember the case of the former state secretary, late General Colin Powell, when he presented this case of the Iraqi mobile weapons production facilities in the state secu- in uh, Security Council of UN, all because of the fact that the curveball that was the nickname of the of the source of intelligence mm-hmm. was a fake. What was the result? Okay, Re- invasion and liberation of Iraq was one result, but later it was a problem for the reputation of intelligence and the reputation of the c- calling power by himself, yeah. who had a stellar reputation until that moment. Uh, as a, as, a, as a general, as a as a military person, so yeah, it's reputation is key here, isn't it? Yes, uh, we, we we used to have it. You have to have a clean cheek. Yeah, you have to have a clean heads. Hands. Uh, that is the one of the reasons why sharing intelligence is a very sensitive job. Also, yeah. it's not just okay. I will give it to you. I'm going to give it to me. We will see it. Blah blah blah. It's a process, yeah. and mutual understanding, mutual relations, mutual trust. Mutual perception is as higher relevance, as higher confidence, it's a better cooperation. One of the first insights and lessons in diplomacy that I got as a, as a young student was that uh, in diplomacy, because there's a common kind of misperception, I think, uh, that in diplomacy there's lying, there is, you know, these kinds of deceptions. Uh, and really, one, as one gets experienced in diplomacy, one sees that, no, on the contrary, if one is perceived to be lying uh, to others, immediately they're ostracized, they're put to the side, they're not, they lose their relevance. Ignore. One can work with information in different ways. Uh, sometimes you don't want to divulge information 
uh, that uh, is in, in the national interest not to divulge it. But to lie is a completely different uh, uh, matter. And it, it, I'm really glad that you highlighted this, that uh, in, in the intelligence community as well, because I think that there's a misperception, I think, about the intelligence community as well. You know, this espionage, this, that. No, there, it, it's quite a different manner of really getting the best information, the best intelligence, uh, in order to protect your your state uh, in, a, in a better way. But that can be done within kind of a bon ton way, within a, a protocol that has been established over years uh, and a communication between states. Well, from my history as an intelligence officer, we learned and we were very happy that we have a director at that time, late Professor Tujman, and that we never lied. Mm. We did not comment sometimes, we didn't say, but we never lied. We were trustful partners. And that was one of the reasons why we were very, very respectable partners at that time, even during the war. Uh, because we saw it sometimes that if someone lies, those lies can stay somewhere for a day, week, or month, but not for so long. And it, this lie will be understandable as a lie and will be recognized as a lie. And according to that, you will identify who is behind that lie and you will, they are not going to ignore him mm -hmm. completely, but you will put him aside and to take special care and it will forget the relevance. Yep. For example, during the war, I, I saw so many times that we were approached, I'm now talking from the Croatian position, as a very high, highly relevant partners. Because even when the truth was not in our favor, we never lied. Mm. Because you need to have this high level. Mm. Of course, you have to go. Uh, I, I will give you something that it's not often openly known, but I, I think it was public published a few, few years ago. For example, the, the importance of intelligence agency that does not lie grows with the time. Mm. Uh, I remember the meeting with that time commander or Supreme Allied commander in Europe and his deputy when they were here concerning the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Wesley Clark at that time or no. perhaps? No. Uh, well, this was, a, I'm sorry, this is much before, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I cannot say that, I can't say the car. It was written when it was that, I'm yeah. going to, I, I, <laughs> but if you compare it with the time, then you will find it. It was in 98, 99. Uh, they said in some of our meetings that the majority, vast majorities, more than 70% of useful intelligence about Bosnia and Herzegovina, they get it from one source, from Croatian side. And that means a lot. Yeah. Because we were, it means that we were able to collect, integrate, and disseminate useful intelligence, not just for us for the purpose of international community. And that's one of the support wings of any state and diplomas, because intelligence, be their information activities, needs and are part of the overall activities of the government in diplomatic relations, establishing diplomatic relations, just like economy, just like a sport, etc. So I'm, I'm very glad that you start this idea because diplomacy and intelligence have so many common and not just information the relations and in most cases intelligence activities go before the official diplomatic relations i remember that we have contacts with some countries as an intelligence officers quite before that we develop official diplomatic relations now so this is one of the hidden non-seeable activities of the intelligence in these international relations. I think no no better uh, point to end this uh, really very informative uh, uh, conversation. One of my goals with this podcast is really to um, uh, kind of take away the mystery from diplomacy to really, uh, because the, the, the focus is on diplomacy and its combinations with other uh, aspects. Uh, and thank you very much for really doing that in terms of this combination of the diplomacy uh, and intelligence, but specifically kind of unveiling and demystifying what it is all about. I've learned a lot uh, and I hopefully 
uh, our viewers uh, have as well. So, uh, Gordon, thank you very much for a great conversation. Yep. It was a pleasure. I look forward to any presentation. Of course. Yeah, you can come, whatever you need. <laughs> I hope that we are going to see how it is now for. That's will, this will be wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, dear viewers, dear listeners. This was a Diplomacy Light podcast, the seventh one, the 007, uh, appropriately titled for the topic that we had on diplomacy and intelligence. Look forward to seeing you again at the next one. Thank you. Thank you.